Um, we are now starting, uh, <laughs> starting the hardest part of immunology. If, if it were me, I would call this next unit Thunderdome. It's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. It's very weird, confusing stuff. I'm going to tell you that your immune cells essentially rearrange their own chromosomes. They cut and paste information in or out of chromosomes. And you are going to be like, no, that's not a thing that should happen. That's cancer. That kills people. That's not good. And I'm going to tell you, yeah, that actually is what happens. So there's going to be a lot of confusing stuff. And I'm going to try as hard as I can to simplify these concepts. But um, in the modules for the next couple of weeks, I've added some videos. And some of these are a little bit longer. They're a little more extensive. Um, one of them, we, we watch a guy who's going to look at the different gene segments and he's going to show you construction and building a BCR or TCR, which is actually really helpful to me. There are some other ones in here, too, reminding ourselves about this other really hard concept, which is um, understanding the major histocompatibility complex. That's what MHC stands for. Um, it is analogous to, in humans, something called the human leukocyte antigen. But we're going to talk about what, what are these things, what do they do, why are they so important, um, and hopefully we'll make some sense of it. Uh, because it's critical to understand gene rearrangement and how MHC works in order to be able to understand the production and maturation of B cells and T cells. So that's sort of how the unit N, where we think about Okay, little tiny hematopoietic stem cell grows and divides, becomes a lymphoid progenitor. That lymphoid progenitor makes some decisions to become an NK cell, a T cell, a B cell. How, what, what are the events that occur that allow for those different cells to be made? How do they mature? How do they go through special selection processes to be sure that they behave the way we want them to? We're gonna have to talk all about that, but building this foundational bit, understanding how gene rearrangement works, is not easy. I, I don't know how else to I don't know how else to mentally prepare you for the idea that it is it is not easy, it's confusing. If you're confused, that's okay. That's totally and completely normal. And <laughs> we'll try as many times as we can to go over the information to make it make sense. This is a place where I think, uh, especially if you're any kind of um, you, you like to draw and write things, draw yourself pictures. This is very helpful for this unit of information. Being able to just have some extra paper to scribble on, different colored pens and pencils and markers help to help understand where all the bits and pieces come from and how everything comes together. Yeah? Will this be drawings that you do, like on the board, or will these just Sometimes I'm going to draw things, and there will be also be pictures in the PowerPoints, too. But I would strongly suggest practicing making your own drawings to, to help solidify how this process works. Um, this is the hardest stuff, I think, conceptually in immunology. If you, can, if you can kind of get this organized in your brain in a way that it makes sense, then this, this is the hardest stuff that you will feel. Not to learn. Um, I will make sure, because I can see right now that the later chapters are not visible to you yet, so I'll make sure that I turn that on. Um, but BCR, TCR rearrangement, and understanding MHC should be a major sort of focus right now, trying to, trying to understand how that works. So, beginning at the beginning. Um, the B cell and the T cell have their own specialized receptor for detecting antigen on their surface, right? And we abbreviate those, the BCR, B cell receptor, and the TCR, the T cell receptor. And as we have noted and looked at a little bit before, the B cell receptor is analogous to an antibody. So 
only difference between those two molecules is one is soluble and one is trapped inside a membrane. So now we're just going to look at the processes of how this specialized receptor gets built. We're also going to look at the TCR too. But it was the B cell receptor, the pieces and parts, the genes that were discovered first. So that's why typically we tend to start off in an immunology course talking about building the TCR as opposed to building the TCR because that was just discovered later. Uh, what do we have here? We have um, a molecule that could be described as a homodimer, right? If I cut this thing down the middle, especially when we're talking about the TCR, we have something that is a mirror image of itself. The TCR, on the other hand, actually is this inserted into a membrane. So it is a little bit structurally smaller molecule, but it has the element of a light chain and a heavy chain. It has a variable regions here for recognizing these events and the constant regions for holding that molecule into a membrane. Um, here we can see, and I like this picture because it's got, got nice labeling for us to remind us that have what we would consider what we would call constant regions. These are the regions, these are the anchors that stabilize and hold the molecule together. We have variable region at the very end of this constant region here, and then you have a light chain which also has a constant region and a variable region. But the idea of these variable regions, variation, right, letting me see different antigens. So these work differently from pattern recognition receptors. They don't see patterns. They can see all the other stuff that's not combined into these receptors. Okay, so these are basic structures here. Also, from the BCR and the TCR, right, you have this molecule that's anchored into a membrane, but another very important part of this molecule are the accessory pieces. IG alpha beta chains are always associated with the BCR. And this group of co molecules known as the CD3 complex. The purpose, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, is that these co, I wouldn't really call them receptors, but these uh, accessory molecules provide the cytoplasmic tails that contain the intracellular tyrosine activation motifs, actual regions that can undergo autophosphorylation or cross-phosphorylation or be phosphorylated and act as the recruitment center for signal transduction. Right? So notice how the BCR itself just has these little tiny little stubs. They are not long enough, the intracellular portion is not long enough or large enough to act as the signal transduction beacon. It's too short. So you have to have these accessory molecules to aid in signal transduction from the BCR. And the same thing happens for the TCR. You have various groups of different chains. They could be epsilon chains, gamma chains, delta chains, zeta chains, doesn't, doesn't matter. They, we can mix and match some different ones in here, but they all Right, contain those tyrosine activation motifs. They get phosphorylated when an antigen binds with the antigen binding receptor. For B cells, right, we've got two sides. I can grab antigens that have not been processed or displayed by anybody else. B cells can recognize antigen on their own. This is not true for T cells. T cells must always be presented antigen that has been processed by an antigen presentation cell. So they can only interact with one antigen at a time, right? Because we only have essentially one binding cleft, where our BCRs have two binding clefts. Okay, so um, reminding ourselves about the parts. The heavy chain parts. Heavy chains act sort of like the anchor for the molecule. 
light chains act as an accessory support piece. And this is all about having this special little binding pocket right here to collect antigens. I think, I think, oh, there's another thing to point out here. Just a bit. And then it's like, what are all these labels? What's going on here? Our heavy chains, right? And we know that this is a heavy chain because we always have a little H. You know, this is a light chain, so we always have L. Our heavy chains, there are families of gene information. They are the epsilon, ID. Delta, IgG, Alpha, IgA, Gamma, IgG, uh, Mu, IgM. So there's five different flavors of antibodies that get made. The heavy chain that you make, which group of genes you use to build your heavy chain, dictates if you use the Mu gene, you are IgM. If you use the Gamma gene, you are IgG. So this is what dictates how our genes are classified. And I'm going to show you a picture that explains a little bit more about this, but I didn't want to just leave you hanging here like, whoa, what's up with this and all these different heavy chains? That's, that's how we classify our different ice types of antibodies. Okay, this is always our antigen binding region. This is our constant region. This is going to be bound by a complement. Lots of innate immune cells have special receptors that are capable of seeing these little, these little feet stocks so they can see things that are optimized with antibodies and the vagocytosis so it gives you granulation appropriately whichever cell senses this molecule is going to be bound. The PCR on the other hand is never soluble it's always inserted in a membrane it's not, it's not going anywhere. This is another reason why T cell immunity is always referred to as cell mediated immunity. It always requires cell to cell contact to get some kind of outcome to get some kind of process to happen antigen presentation cell like macrophage is going to come along here it's going to show T cell antigen it has collected and that will turn on signal transduction inside the T cell allowing the T cell to decide what to do with that. All right so it turns out that as we have studied antibodies we have learned that there that, that our bodies, that animals, are capable of producing literally billions of different BCRs inside them. So each B cell that is born inside my bone marrow is unique from the others that have been born from my bone marrow. And this made immunologists wonder, how does this happen? I don't have billions of these. I have millions of genes and really not that many millions of genes. So how is it possible for me to make billions of different variations on this one type of protein when that's not encoded within my genome? And what they realized was that the instructions for making pattern recognition receptors were certainly there buried within genomes and we could see them and all the pattern recognition receptors were always made the same. But when we look at these receptors, they were always different. We didn't understand at first how that was possible. How could I make, how could I make billions of different binding pockets here out of a finite number of genes? And there really aren't even that many genes to make this protein. So how was that happening? What we learned is that we have sets of genes that are used to build these proteins. And the way that I like to think about those sets of genes is like a deck of cards, right? We have a deck of cards that has 52 cards in it. But when you take the deck apart and you look, you have different suits, right? You have four different suits here. Uh, hearts and clubs and spades and diamonds, right? And within those four different suits, you have the same number of cards, right? You have a king, a queen, a jack, this is more or less the system that our cells use to produce tons 
a variation in building these sets of proteins. I'm going to mix and match. I'm going to shuffle the deck and, and deal that deck. And every time I'm going to get a different hand. So the way that this looks, essentially, the information is coded or laid out in a chromosome, is that you have a number of genes that are responsible for encoding, building that light chain structure and building that heavy chain structure. And what you do is you pick a version of a card from each suit and put them together to make your hand. So what is being shown right here is essentially this would be a chromosome that's been untwisted and laid out flat, right? Like the choo-choo track, like the lattice, the rungs of DNA. And it's showing you portions of information that's encoded within that portion that we've unwound and laid out. So you can see that here we've got V. V stands for variable region. So all we're showing right now is that there are three different variable regions. Here, there's a joining region. The joining region is the region that joins the variable region and the constant region. So we've got one, two, three, four, five different versions of joiners. And then down here, I have a block that's known as the constant region. Now, I know that this picture isn't labeled and it doesn't tell you this, but this is more or less the layout for building a light chain. When we build light chains, we put together variable, joining, and constant regions. And here I have three different variable versions, five different joining versions, and then a constant region. And that's fine. I don't need variability in my constant region because it's not responsible for binding these things. I only need variability in my variability regions because that's where I'm going to encounter antigens. So what can happen? I'm going to shuffle the deck. I'm going to pick variable region one, and I'm going to join that to joining region two. And we're going to clip that on to a constant region. And then the next time we make a B cell, we're going to pick variable region three, and we're going to pick joining region one, and we're going to clip that on to a constant region, right? You see, we're mixing and matching to make different versions. Now, it turns out, that there are, depending upon whether we're building a light chain or a heavy chain, a lot more than three or five or whatever choices to pick from. Okay. We're going to mix and match the parts together to recombine new versions of proteins. All right, so right here, this top portion, I have what I know is a light chain. This is the layout for a light chain because I know, I'm going to back up and I'll show you, that light chains contain this, right? A shorter piece of protein. So there's a variable region, there's a region that holds the two molecules together, and then there's a constant region. If I'm building a heavy chain, it's a little more complicated. I have a variable region. Uh, then diversity and joining regions, and then constant regions. So there's a little, there's another, there's another deck that gets thrown into the mix when we build a heavy chain. It's just a longer protein, so there's more pieces to come together. So I know that I'm building a light chain here because I have variable and joining regions that I'm going to hook up to a constant region. In this case, I know that I'm building a heavy chain because I have variable regions, diversity regions, and joining regions, which I will then hook up to a constant region that's either an M, a D, an A, an E, to make any different flavors of enzymes, an amine, an alpha, an epsilon. Right? So this is a, just a very simplified view. It's not showing us all of the different versions of these that are encoded in here, all the different Ds in here, the different Ds, the different Js, but they're in collections and they're grouped together in different places, actually in different locations, in different chromosomes. So that makes life even more interesting and complicated. 
not all of this information is going to generate the same thing on its own. So light chain information is on two different chromosomes. Heavy chain information can be scattered in different chromosomes depending on what the club normal you are. And in a couple slides, I have an excellent table that tells you where the information is, if you're me or if you're a mouse. Yes? So the light chain don't they don't, right? So light chains are just V, J, Z. Heavy chains are V, D, J, Z. All right. So this tells us about where is all this stuff located. If we're building a B cell, right, we're making that homodimer, that mirror image. So I need two heavy chains and two light chains, right? One for either side of the molecule that I'm building. And it turns out that they are identical to each other. So if I, if I chop this molecule in half, like this, this is exactly the same as this, same thing. If it's bound into a membrane and I cut it down the middle, here's my heavy chain, here's my light chain, these are identical, these are identical. So it means they bind the same stuff. So you're never going to get an antibody that in one hand binds antigen A and another hand binds antigen B. They're identical to each other, they're always going to bind the same stuff. Okay, so we got to build these heavy chains, we got to build the light chains. First, developmentally, when B cells are growing, when they decide, I'm going to be a B cell, they build their heavy chain first because that is the anchor molecule. That's the thing that really holds the structure together. Our heavy chain information, so building heavy chains, the V's, the D's, the J's, the C's, are located on our chromosome 14. So all the information for building that anchor, the inside part of the antibody or the BCR, is encoded on chromosome 14. You also need to build a little accessory, a little light chain placeholder. That information comes from someplace else. And you actually have two different pools of genes to pick from. If you're a mammal, humans make a pretty even split of B cells. Some B cells have lambda light chains. So that's what this guy is right here, this letter, this Greek letter lambda. We have some B cells build a heavy chain, they have a lambda light chain. Some of our B cells build a heavy chain and they're paired with a kappa light chain. So all the lambda genes come from chromosome 22, all the kappa genes come from chromosome 2. So scattered around different locations. Our information is located in different places than in mice. Um, almost always in immunology, um, our go-to animal to use for experimentation, for learning about B-cell and T-cell development, for learning about how our bodies respond to antigens, is almost always mice, because they're small, they're easy to handle, right? they're easy to house, easier to work with. Um, I mean, obviously, you all realize, right, that mice are not the most closely related mammal to you and me. Right? But if we went to other apes or other primates, we would now run into a lot more issues about handling those animals. Right? So almost all of the legwork in immunology, the background work in immunology is done with mice, just because of the ease and care of use. But most of these experiments certainly have been repeated now in primates. And we've been able to collect data in humans that support everything that we've seen in our data collection in animals. So I've got to build a heavy chain and then I have to build a light chain and I can pick from information that is located in different spots. But as I mentioned to you earlier, right, I'm going to pick pieces and parts. This picture is not as good. I've got to pick segments of the chromosome genic pieces to put together, there's pieces of information that are going to be excised, that are going to be cut out. 
Yes, I mean that there are pieces of your chromosome, your chromosome 22, your chromosome 2, your chromosome 14, that literally get cut out and degraded and destroyed inside the cell that is making this new B cell receptor. So you can imagine that sometimes we see mutations, we see problems, we see aberrations in what happens when we're cutting and pasting these chromosomes together. Most likely, we're going to see those problems in the chromosomes that we're cutting apart and shuffling, but not always. I'll show you some examples where that doesn't always happen. Right? So you literally, your immune cells, have to rearrange the genetic information on these chromosomes to come up with the structure that you're going to build. This is a lot more accurate representation of how much information is laid out on the chromosome that we're looking at. Uh, I'm pretty sure right now that actually the information that is laid out right here is actually the way a mouse chromosomal information would be laid out, but it doesn't matter. Or is it very, very close? You're going to have all of your variable region for building your heavy chain upstream have uh, 14 different diversity regions, four different joining regions, and then you have your various groups of information that encode for your different antibody isotypes. So these hold the mu genes, this is for making IgM. These hold the delta genes for making IgD. Interestingly enough, the first type of antibodies that B cell make when they're growing and dividing is IgM and IgD. And when they express both of these on the surface of the B cell, we have a fully mature B cell that's ready to go and do its work. Downstream, you have different types of gamma. This is gamma 3, gamma 1, gamma 2B, 2A. Depending upon which mammal you are, you have different variations of IgG that you make. Epsilon, IgE, alpha, IgA. Um, so would the light chain look pretty similar to that, just without the Gs? Kind of, yeah. I maybe have a picture of light chain coming up here. But yes, this is more or less the way it would be laid out. And you'd just be missing this chunk for the light chain. Uh, your constant region is actually only one constant region. So the light chain constant region does